Hey guys, Tim here, Big Dog Forge. Welcome back to the shop. It's good to see you again. So this time around, we're going to make a knife from India. It's uh, a knife that's been around for a really long time. It's a uh, Rampuri Chaku. And uh, I discovered this thing in my research when I was trying to figure out what to do with the Damascus that we made from the document from 1824. And apparently these things have been around for quite a long time and we're going to do our rendition of it so stick with me should be fun and uh we'll have a new video coming out real soon thanks guys talk to you soon bye now this is the billet that we'll be using for the knife we're making today this is a recap from the 200 year old damascus from a recipe bombay india 1824 and uh, consisted of barrel bands, files, and cast iron powder. The steel was left outside to rust for six months. The rustier the better, as far as the recipe was concerned. We forge welded this and folded it several times to come up with 1,800 layers. We cut that in half and sand mined that around a piece of 1084 to use as a cutting edge and a knife. We went ahead and cleaned that up and here's our etch. We have 1800 layers on either side of a piece of 1084. This is a Rampuri Chaku. It's a knife from India from the Rampur district in Uttar Pradesh and it is a knife that's been around since the 18th century. Typically these were a gravity knife. This particular one has a spring in it. It's a spring assist type knife. And we are going to build something a little more traditional th than this. This one was built in the 1990s. They still make these. They still sell them in the shops in Rampur. This particular knife has cast aluminum handles and uh, some various odd pieces and parts. We'll be using this as our billet. To create the blade we'll have to thin this out, draw it out. This knife we just took apart had a four and a quarter inch blade. We're going to go by the six and a half to seven inch blade. So we'll get this pressed down to thin it out and we're going to have to uh, be careful take our time here with that 1084 in the middle we don't want to push it offside and get it out of alignment in the center because we need that to end up on the edge of our knife till we get a consistent steel cutting edge and it's really more about the aesthetic with that dark steel running up the edge of the blade I think it'll give it a a good contrast nice look so we get this straightened up as best we can and we'll let it cool on the anvil slowly when I get into the surface grinder we've got a 40 grit belt on there to take the scale all that good stuff off once that's off we'll swap over to 100 grit and uh, clean it up a little bit we're gonna start grinding on this real quick and it's nice not to have to grind out all those heavy heavy scratches so here we go and we're going to you know base this off the blade from the original knife to give us kind of an idea of the shape we want but i think we're going to stylize it just a little more and we're going to go with something about two inches longer some of these knives that were made um, back in the day were up to 12 inch long blades on them so we got a little paper template cut out and we're going to go ahead and glue that to the face of this billet. The spray adhesive seems to work really, really well for this. And uh, just sprayed some on the uh, billet there. We had a little much, so we dabbed some off. And we'll get our paper template on this. So we're grinding our blade immediately, right off, because we're going to have to build our handle around this blade. The uh, shapes of these handles are a little bit unique for the traditional style and uh, I want to be able to 
shape my handle around my blade. It'll make it a little easier for me in this particular instance. So it was a little bit of a process getting this cut out on this bandsaw. So you're getting the tail end of this just to save you the uh, time it took. But you can see how this is cutting. It was, it's some tough stuff. I think it'll make a really good blade. These guys that were making this material way back in the day, they knew what they were doing, combining these materials in the way they did. It's got a cool look and it is nice and strong. We're going to go ahead and keep grinding on this guy and get it into a bevel jig to establish our bevels. And we'll take as much meat off this as we can. We need a pretty good established blade shape in width, length, curvature, all of that so that we can plan this handle really well. It's not something that we can uh, trial and error too much, so. All right, and we did pretty good. We kept our 1084 in the center, right there on the edge. And the pattern is looking really well. Let's see what the other side looks like here. And it looks like that edge is just showing up on this side as well. So looks like we're pretty good. We still have a little bit of meat on this blade. We'll narrow it up a little bit. But uh, we're going to start designing a handle here. So based on pictures online, other things I've seen, folks I've talked to, we're going to basically do our own take on a earlier version of this with a brass and wood handle. They have sort of a fishtail at the end and a variety of different types of tops on them. So what you see me working with here is a polymer clay and this stuff stays pliable forever until you bake it at about 275 degrees in the oven. Uh, 15 minutes per quarter inch and what I'm doing is I'm sculpting out a model that we'll be, we will be using to model our handle after. But this way I can make this organic shape and I can fit it perfectly to my knife blade. So on these particular knives in the bolster area, there's an offset on one side of the knife that the release lever hinges into and out of. It's what I'm creating here and we're supporting that with a little piece of brass so it doesn't uh, deform in the oven. And we get this thing baked up. It'll turn a little brown and uh, it'll get hard enough that we can handle it without it uh, moving all over the place. And it did warp a little bit in the oven, which isn't really a big deal. We're going to be using this particular piece as a model. There's a light sensitive area upcoming. You may want to skip ahead to 10 minutes, 17 seconds if you're light sensitive. We're going to do some structured light scanning on this handle and it does involve some flashing lights, so beware. Okay, we've got this mounted to a block. We can spin it 360 and this is our structured light scanner and this will create a three-dimensional model that we can export as an OBJ or STL file. The disk at the bottom that you see with numbers on it are an index disk. It helps the computer to align the uh, multiple scans that we'll be taking of this. In the upper left hand corner you can see what the computer screen looks like as I'm doing these scans. We've got the computer set to a fairly high sensitivity level so we can get some good detail out of this. There are areas that the computer and the light scan cannot quite see at the bottom, the very tips, so it will automatically fill any holes in for us based on the shape of the object. So this is our shape fusion program and it is fusing together 
all the shapes that we scanned into a singular model. We will simply delete the disk on the bottom, which was our indexing disk. We'll give it one last global alignment to make sure it's all fitting together nicely. And then we will fuse this together in a low poly. See how it looks. And then we will increase the poly count and refine this into a more sharp, detailed object. At this point, we can save this, export it, and bring it into our 3D slicing program. We're going to use Microsoft's 3D Builder for this simple step. We're simply going to slice the handle in half so we end up with well, what we could call two scales and we will align them to fit into our 3D printer. We will export that as an OBJ and bring that into Ultimaker Curry. We'll go ahead and slice this and export that to the CR10 Creality V2 and go ahead and let it print those guys up. These are going to be patterns for either side of the knife. We'll be able to cut all of our internal pieces based on these shapes and get a good feel for what the handle is going to feel like if we need to make any adjustments. There we go. Okay, now that we have our handle patterns basically made, we're going to transfer the pivot pin and locking pin holes into our new blade from the old one. And uh, these are the bits we'll be using. We're just using centering bits. They're uh, just under eighth inch. And we took our time to get this right. These holes are precise. They need to be in exactly the right place to get this to work correctly. Okay, and based on the holes that we have in the blade and our 3D printed pattern handles, we can figure out exactly where we need to drill those holes for those pivots and locking pins. In the liners, which I am tracing out here, these are made from 15 in 20. This is sawmill blade. I'll super glue two of these together and cut them out at the same time. We got them pretty close to the handle. We're going to leave a little extra on there so that we can grind down to what we need. There we go. Got the super glue cleaned off. All right. So we're going to start marking out a piece of quarter inch mild steel and we'll use the calipers to follow the inside of this curvature which matches the blade and what we're going to be cutting out here is the spine of the knife so the spine will be the support for the liners the handles and uh, the internal spring on this guy and we're simply going to get this over to the bandsaw and cut it out so I really didn't take too long to do this um, you will see a space that I will notch to hold a spring and that will be our assist spring for this particular knife like I said earlier these knives were um, a gravity knife and at some point they became spring assist a long time ago from what I understand and getting all these contours just right to interact with the spring in this particular blade it was not too difficult but uh, it took a little tweaking these are going to be our rivet holds to hold our liners and handle on with 
couple of these holes were planned out, others were just randomly placed and we're going to base all of our rivets on this particular piece. And we'll get her refined. I'm going to leave a little bit of material on the back side of the spine that protrudes out the knife so that we can uh, grind to shape to match the other components, the handles, the liners, that kind of thing. All right, we took our spine and we super glued it to both of our uh, inner liners so we can transfer these pin holes. And this alignment will help us to complete the mechanism for the blade. And we've got a piece of coil spring is what this is. I did not heat it. I simply straightened out a coil spring that was the correct diameter. It's a little bit larger around than the original. The blade is a little larger. We created a notch in the spine. We forged the end of that spring out slightly to fit in that notch and drove it in the side. And I'll simply peen this mild steel down over that spring and lock it into place. I'm going to file up the sides, make it nice and flat, so the liners sit nice and flush. And that's going to be our spine and our two liners. We got ourselves some pins to line everything up with, and we can start aligning our blade. And you can see the holes in the liners where the pivot pin is for the blade. We drilled those based off of our 3D printed scales. For what looked good when the knife was opened and closed. And we'll just get a, an idea of what this looks like. See if this spring works at all. There we go. Looks like that's going to work just fine. These things are rather large. The blade is heavy, so it's going to be a little bit of a slow opener, but it should work just fine. Okay, so this is going to be our release spring. It's from a little thicker piece of sawmill blade, 15 and 20. This stuff's got some good springy quality to it and this will be what will lock our blade into place. It's got a small pin in the end of it, and that pin is what locks into the uh, different points on the blade to hold it in place. That particular material for that pin was a little bit of a challenge to figure out what kind of material to use, but once I did, it worked out quite well. I am silver soldering the pin to the end of that spring in alignment with the blade as it's closed. And we went ahead and drilled a couple of holes and riveted that into place in two spots so it would not move around. And we're checking our spine as opposed to the blade to make sure the blade is a few thousandths thinner than the spine. We want some clearance there. I will file a couple of brass shims. All right, we're finally going to quench this blade and see if it comes out straight. Looks pretty good. Okay. So that guy we cleaned up, put in the oven for tempering, and we'll ignore him for a while. And this is going to be the, it's actually bronze, that we're going to use for our handle scales. And we're going to make these in two parts. So these are just about 3 16ths of an inch thick, and we will stack 
two of them to make our handles. So that as we grind them, we'll have enough material to make a nice rounded contour. So this is the old Boyce Crane bandsaw. If you haven't seen the video on where I refurbished this thing, a friend of mine it was going in the garbage and he's saved it, brought it to me, and I was able to put it back together. Built in the 1930s and it was the only bandsaw in the shop that would handle this material without getting all gummed up or whatever. Anyway, great little tool. You should check out the video for it. Anyway, the scale on the lever side has to have room for a the lever spring in it that we riveted to the inner liner. So we're going to mill all the way through this guy. And when we double these plates up, it'll leave this cavity for that particular spring and pin as a release pin. There you go. All right, so that's where that is going to fit. And this will lay over the top of it. Now our outer handle pieces, we're going to cut them into sections. And in between this, we're going to be putting some wood in. We're gonna super glue these guys all together. And for the most part, this super glue trick works pretty well. It didn't work so well on this bronze, but we got through this. It uh, keeps things aligned pretty well. And um, you can get your pinholes pretty straight. You just have to have your metal fairly clean for it to stick. And for an insurance policy, I just put a vice grip on it. But we will drill our pinholes all the way through. For our rivets and we have oversized all of these pieces we've left uh, a good sixteenth to an eighth of an inch of material all the way around on these scales and handles so that we can grind back to where we want it to be sort of uh, sculpt it on the belt grinder when it's time there we go all right. So we'll figure out which part of these outer handle pieces that we want to cut away. And we will we'll pin them together and get them back out to the bandsaw. So we sort of strategically placed these pinholes so that the pieces would all stay aligned so that we can cut the wooden portion of our scales and fit between the outers. So we need to cut the top off this. This is the offset that we made in our model handle that will allow our release lever to recess into. So this is what this cutout looks like towards the bolster of the knife. Now our release lever will use that step as a fulcrum or a pivot point to pull that pin up. There's our blade fresh out of the tempering oven. Beautiful color on it. Seems to be working really well. And we are not going to do any more work on that blade for a while. We're going to be messing around with this and probably put a few scratches in it, that kind of thing that'll have to be sand, hand sanded out later. So we're simply going to leave it at this stage so we can, can finish the uh, construction on the handles and the mechanisms. Once we get all these pieces assembled, we'll get this guy out to the belt grinder and we will take some of the excess material off the outside before we decide which kind of scales we're going to put on this. And a couple of pairs of ice grips to make sure everything stays together 
and we'll grind this bronze right down to the steel. Most of the way around. On the blade side, we're going to leave just a little bit more so we can refine that. So we'll take all of our pieces and we're going to tin this bronze by getting a little flux on it and some solder and wipe that off and that'll tin that very nicely and we'll lay our pieces together some alignment pins to keep everything straight and we'll go ahead and flow some solder in there are you plumbers out there will sweat the solder in I like that. It'll tend to follow the heat, so as we introduce it to the edges, it'll work its way towards the center. But with both pieces tinned like that, they should solder together fully anyway. And the solder is got no lead in it. It's got a higher instance of silver. It's about 11%, so it's not total silver solder, but it is um, stronger than your average plumbing solder, I guess and it's really to fill the gaps and hold it together while we rivet everything together anyway so we get all these pieces assembled we can do a little clean up and get ready to uh, put our wood scales in place we have to hold some pins together here get that thing lined up before it cools off too far oh, psh, goofball get, there you go it's like a circus trick. Anyway, here we go. That's not working out very well. And get a block underneath that thing, you goofball. There you go. You figured it out. As a friend of mine tells me, I may not be the sharpest tool in the shed, but at least I'm in the shed. <laughs> there we go. And we're squaring off these corners where that solder flowed to this uh, wood. And this is Kokoboro. And we'll simply mark it out where it needs to be cut. And since those shapes in the handles are sort of wedge shaped, we can cut these pieces and simply press them in until they're aligned at both ends. And grind off the excess. There we go. I get some of that five minute epoxy on these things. And we have a couple of holes that we can use to run a rivet through the wood as well. So it'll have a mechanical connection as well as oh, there's a bubble in my epoxy tube. That's a pain. All right, I got her. So we'll be able to run a mechanical fastener through the wood as well as the epoxy holding it to the knife. Be a lot more durable. It really should be wearing gloves for this, but at this point my hands are dirty enough that the glue won't stick to them anyway. So. I got that going for me. All right. So while this is going on, these knives have uh, quite a history in India. Um, they were used in a lot of 1960s and 70s India mafia movies. The bad guys were constantly threatening the good guys with these things in those movies. <laughs> And they became villainized a little bit. So the uh, local authorities decided that they needed to limit the blade length on these things to four, four and a half inches. We'll do a final sort of fit up here without the blade in it or the spine. And we'll get this thing back out to the belt grinder. And we will contour these handles to the shape that we want. 
now that the glue is dried we're going to put some temporary brass pins in there that we can grind down they won't get in the way and they'll hold everything together where we want it I'll trim off the excess and we'll do our final grind on this thing so these things are still in mainstream sort of pop culture in India as recently as 2018 a movie came out from Bollywood I believe the name of it was Blackmail and uh, there was a theme song that went with this particular movie that involved this particular knife so there you go this uh, knife has had quite a history as you read Wikipedia and other sites on the internet it's uh, been built since the 18th century or some form of it in Rampur, India, in the state of Uttar Pradesh, and uh, it's becoming what they're calling an extinct knife, simply because it fell out of popularity. And when I discovered this knife in my research, I just thought it was really cool. So. The recipe that led us to the Damascus from 1824 to this particular knife built in this little district in a state in India that was from earlier than that document. I thought it would be really awesome to couple the two up. All right. We're going to do an etch on this blade before our final assembly and see what she looks like. And in their document, they talk about raising the vein on these. And this is what they're talking about. You can see those veins of steel running through this. And remember, this is mild steel barrel bands. It's old files and cast iron powder between every layer. In the document, they said they would leave this in vinegar for about five days to raise the vein. It only took moments with the ferric chloride and it looks pretty good. We'll go ahead and get this knife assembled and see what she looks like. I'm very happy with that pattern though. And the fact we were able to keep that 1084 centered as well as we did. So I did a little hand sanding um, off camera. This video is a little longer than it probably should be. And we've used some odd and unorthodox methods to get to this point. But it was fun. And uh, this final assembly is really an anxious point for me because putting this together once it's together pulling it apart to adjust any of the uh, springs or latches or pins is not going to be possible not without uh, probably damaging the thing so we're going to uh, set all of our rivets these are all brass except for the pivot for the blade it is mild steel and the reason I made it mild steel is if I do need to replace that I'll be able to grind it off with the die grinder and uh, get to that at least get the blade out if I have to and that will be our pivot for our blade that I'm putting in right here so I used a piece of quarter inch thick bronze and I simply filed my push button my lever out of it and put a hole through it for my retainer pin and that's going on there we'll give this thing a try and then we'll take a little closer look at it see 
seems to work okay. Let me get a little lube on this thing. All right, guys, there you go. There you go, guys. <laughs> anyway, so uh, thanks for dropping by. Really appreciate it. You guys take care of yourselves, and we'll have another video out for you here real soon. Um, got some new technology in the shop, some new toys, and we're going to be using those to uh, do a few things. So thanks for sticking with me, guys. Thanks for being so patient through the uh, great unpleasantness that we've gone through recently. <laughs> and, uh, take care of yourselves. We'll uh, see you soon. Be safe. Bye-bye now.